Hello programmers, game developers, and topology fans. My name is John Heyer and I am an information topologist. In this video, I will look at some architectural considerations required for a virtual board game with orthogonal movement through an isometric grid. Uh, that means up, down, right, left on a square grid. For my prototype, I chose a board game from the 1960s. It involves moving World War I plane pieces around a board and aligning with an opponent's pieces, at which point cards are played to see which one of the planes will be shot down. The player whose pieces have not all been shot down at the end of the game is the winner. Simple enough, so simple I naively assumed I could bang the code out in one afternoon. But before we get into the topology discussion, let's look at some distracting virtual game pieces. We have dice, in this case two, planes. The internet is filled with historical livery designs for both the German World War II planes and the Allied planes. And it's more fun to explore those than programming tutorials on Stack Overflow. We also have non-moving pieces here, anti-aircraft batteries playing cards, and for the kiddies, what makes every video game great, the not-so-subtle illusion to violence. Now let's delve into why we're here, or at least why I'm here. You may have clicked this video by mistake. Orthogonal movement programming. Here we have two planes. Let's apply the technical nomenclature I use throughout the code, friend and foe. Now the question is, how do we move the friend plane to be adjacent to the foe so we may attack it? Let's start with the easiest example first. When the friend plane is already adjacent to the foe, we're finished, right? Not quite. We still need to roll the dice at the beginning of each turn. We roll the two. Let's see what that will do. We can move two squares in a line again with an attack from the west or the east. Unavailable to us here are attacks from the north and the south. What about a four? With a four, we have many more possibilities. Six, still more. In fact, so many more that we might want to think about categorizing them to keep track and even consider symmetries to save time drawing them all. This is the naive journey I started thinking I could find all the possible solutions quickly and easily. But if you were paying attention, you may have noticed I already missed some. In addition, note, an additional note is that I only showed even dice rolls because from this position, alignment for attack is not possible with odd dice rolls. This is where if you proceed naively like myself, you will soon land in self-inflicted, hand-drawn topology hell. This is a partially completed movement matrix landscape, now a graveyard where my ambition came to die. And we've just touched the upper left corner with our previous examples. Let's put that away, take a deep breath, and go back to one of our previous observations. If we map all the possible start locations that land us adjacent to the target, we get the following plot where, interestingly, each start node is uniquely limited to even or odd parity. If you are on an even marked node, you cannot achieve an attack with an odd number dice roll, and vice versa. Also, if we look at the minimum dice roll to obtain an attack from each node, we get the following, shown here for a single quadrant, but with two-fold symmetry around the target. This is a clue to a generalized rule for all attacks. Plotting dice roll versus distance and making the subsequent matrix squares green where an attack is possible, we get the following pattern. This leads to a useful logical rule of distance plus dice roll must be odd parity and the absolute value of the difference between distance and dice must be greater than or equal to one. One final note before we leave this plot is to note that there are more even dice attack possibilities than odd. 
Now we are ready to generate an algorithm to find these moves. Here is my algorithm for creating all possible moves for a six-sided dice in an orthogonal grid. If a six is rolled, the maximum theoretical number of unique moves is four to the power of six or 4,096 unique explorations of the orthogonal grid. But this number includes double backs and possible transitions through obstructions such as other planes and board boundaries, which is against the rules. So a requirement downstream will be to filter out the double backs and the moves that would take us through obstructions. Now let's look at how we will feed this large list of possible moves into a filter algorithm to create a viable attack move matrix. Let's revisit our simplest case of starting adjacent to the foe and this time consider all four possible orthogonal attack directions. We begin our input description with a distance of 1 with the Excel nomenclature in terms of row and columns. Write the four possible attack directions shown here. Concatenate this together to create a convenient unique input string for our filter algorithm and out pops all possible solutions in the matrix in terms of compass point movement code, a subset of which we already attempted by hand. We'll put the odd attack move metrics next to the even for comparison zoom out, zoom out again, and now you see as promised earlier there are more even possible attack moves than odd possible attack moves. Now let's think about prioritizing the possible choices for attacking a foe. We can build a decision or option matrix based on which plane is attacking which foe with which die on which side. Foe sides are marked FRLB for front, right, left, and back sides, respectively. We can use the dice nominally in the order of the planes or switch, so we, we will require a second option matrix for the switch dice option. We can also down select from our giant attack move matrix to build the corresponding movement matrices for these two option matrices. We can start to think about a global algorithm where we optimize dice usage and take care to have planes that cannot attack move into a so-called staging position or even run away. Finally, if your head is not already hurting, we could talk about game strategy optimization. Here is where I started to think about what categories of optimization could be employed and what coefficients to use. Of course, you could just stop here and hook the program up to a machine learning algorithm. I'll save this discussion for a subsequent video.